Good morning, everybody. Ooh, that does that sound loud. Um, we are ready to start, and we're going to have Joanne Goldman do a brief introduction about our featured study this week, Resolute CAS. Yeah, yeah. uh, so I'm going to talk about the Resolute PAWS study. Uh, this was a, a post-market study uh, by Medtronic for their stents, the Onyx stents. Uh, we had a great success with this study. Uh, it was looking at, actually the slide's a little bit wrong, it's 2.25 to 5 millimeter stents that we looked at, basically in everybody. It was a real world experience. So we did bifurcations, we did instant restenosis, we did stage procedures with the stents. So it was a real nice look at how the stent was actually used. Um, we were very successful in this trial. We, in one, I think it was a month and a half, we enrolled 85 patients and we consented 85 patients and enrolled 49, which made our PI, Yale Wong, number one in the study in the nation. So that was a great success on, on a, it was a team effort and it included the interventional radiol or interventional cardiologist and um, our interventional team that enrolled those patients. So um, we still have um, in that, in the first group, which was the 2.5 to 4.0 vessels, we had um, a total enrollment of 400, and that's enrolled within two months when the study started. So that, that arm's done, and we're just looking at the XL, which is 4.5 to 5.0, and we've enrolled about four patients. We're basically looking at those patients that have had bypass grafts or that we've looked at CTAs prior to procedure um, that could qualify for something that large. Those patients are a little bit harder to find. But all in all, this, this study was a great success for the Institute. Any questions? I'll get the presentation up. And Dr. Kornick, you want to go ahead and make the introduction? It's truly my pleasure to uh, welcome one of the newest members of our electrophysiology group at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. Dr. Zakate uh, joined us uh, this in the last few months. And uh, one of the things uh, uh, that this allows us to do is to get him out in front of you, quite frankly, so you actually recognize who Dr. Zakate is. And you'll be running into him more on the wards and, and doing procedures and such. Uh, now, he hails from uh, Virginia. Now, this isn't Virginia, Minnesota, which is, you know, just down the road from Chisholm. This is actually Richmond, Virginia. And he brings with him his wife, uh, Amy Sue, and, and uh, two boys and a large Great Dane dog. So they're uh, a, a family moving to Minnesota to look for opportunity here with us at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. And so we're very excited to have Dr. Zakate, and he's going to speak to us this morning. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. I could have told you about his education and all that, but <laughs> doctors are well educated. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Let me see if I can press all the right buttons. Very kind. Thank you, Dr. Gornick. Well, um, as Dr. Gornick said, I am brand new here, and I am I couldn't be happier to be here. And it's a pleasure to get to speak with you this morning. You can see the title of my uh, talk this morning is going to be uh, less about the data than uh, the past few grand rounds I've had the privilege to attend. And uh, so I thought we'd just talk about anecdotes a little bit before, before I get started. So I was thinking about anecdotes in medicine and about medical education and, and how we learn the things that we, that we know or that we think we know. And the way it seems to me that it works is that we start with medical knowledge, which is facts. And, and it's things that we know or things that we, at least we think we know, or at least in medical school, it's things that we haven't proven that are incorrect yet. And we're, we're drowning in those things in medical school. We're just being bombarded by facts and things that we have to know. And then we have medical training, and that is what we 
do and how we learn to do the things that we have to offer in medicine and hopefully why we do those things. So we're putting together the, the practice of medicine with, with the knowledge that we've gleaned in medical school. And finally, we come to medical judgment, which is probably the most important of the three, the three elements. And that's how we know when to offer something and when not to, and how to tailor what we offer to the individual patient. And we develop that in practice. So I can, you know, I tend to boil things down into really succinct uh, nuggets of wisdom. And so this is one that always sticks with me, and that is good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from bad judgment. And that, unfortunately, is one of the tenets of medical training. And, and hopefully when we train in large programs, which, which, which I did, um, we have the wisdom to learn from the mistakes of others, and we don't hopefully have to repeat them ourselves. So that brings me to a little bit more of a contemplation of anecdotes. And I said that we gain our experience in medicine in increments of one patient at a time. And I think that's really as much as we study in books and we, we, we train and we learn the data, when we put it in practice, it's it's the provider and the patient in the room trying to figure out what's wrong and what to do about it. And each interaction that we have sort of hones our sense of what we know and what we know to do. And it also can temper our exuberance for offering things and, and intervening and doing things to patients, maybe a little bit. But the way I see it, you know, the, the anecdote is the, is the unit of tangential knowledge. It's, it's, it's what helps to focus our understanding of what we know. And anecdotes are relevant and they're interesting. And if I tell you about something that happened, even while I'm speaking, you're thinking in your mind, oh, I hear something that happened to me one time. And we can have this back and forth about the things that we, that we have learned, the things that we have seen in practice. And, and I find that you know, those interactions are some of the most rewarding and satisfying uh, collegial interactions in medicine when we share what we've learned. I'd say that when we talk about what we do, we talk about the evidence and the data, right? And the data uh, come from averages based on treatment of large groups of patients. And I know from being in Minnesota, what I've learned from Garrison Keillor before I came is that everyone here is above average, and that's, <laughs> I love that. But, uh, but care is what happens between providers and patients, and that's a very individualized thing. And, and no patient hits all of those averages. And so anecdotes are the stories that come from those individual, individual interactions. Those are real and human. And we should share them. So that brings me to why I'm here. Well, this is sort of the uh, eternal question. As a parent, I find the reason that I'm here is usually to be the one to tell my kids how much time there's left before we have to go on to the next activity. More specifically, the reason I'm here this morning is Dr. Sharkey said, be there at 6.30. <laughs> Would I rather be anywhere else? No, I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you all and talk about these things. This is the Cleveland existentialist. I spent five years in Cleveland. And when you're in Cleveland long enough and you get to know the people there, uh, you get this, well, you got to live somewhere attitude. And, uh, and the corollary to that is, at least we're not in Toledo. So this is one of the real reasons that I'm here, and that is that, that uh, I was talking with Dr. Sharkey. He invited me very kindly to give a talk, and I, I was trying to figure out, well, what would that be? And I said, am I, you, you want me to talk about what I've done 
in the past because it doesn't really seem relevant to what we're doing here. And I've, I've seen all these talks given about the data and about new procedures and whatnot, and that's not really what I've been doing. And I said, oh, this, we went back and forth. I said, there's this other thing that I can talk about, and Dr. Tarkey knew about it already. He kind of gave me this, you know, when I hit on the topic, he gave me this look, you know, and I knew that's, that's the endorsement. So very persuasive. But I, uh, the real reason that I'm here in the big picture is that, that I survived an episode that uh, was profound and really modified my outlook and my, about my future and about what I'm doing and changed, changed everything. And so the anecdote that I wanted to share with you is really about that experience and, and uh, tell you why I'm really glad to be here. So when we think about our lives, we think about the chronology of what's gone on. But we also think about what do we anticipate for our own future. And part of our sense of being is really who we think we are and what, where we think we're going. What are we doing? And, you know, you get sort of halfway through it in your 30s, and you're, well, you're well into it, and you say, well, you know, here's where I've been, and here's what I'm expecting. This is my expectation for where I'm going. And we push, you know, we, we, we go, we try to achieve. Well, when I look back in my mid-30s, I spent 13 years at a small Episcopal boys' school. Um, I went to the University of Virginia. I studied literature. I was a writer, you know, so I sort of, the part of my worldview is seeing things in terms of chronology and how stories unfold. The Medical College of Virginia, I was there. You say, this guy's a slow learner. I was there a long time, uh, 95 <laughs> to 2003, because uh, I did my residency there also. And then, talk about a slow learner, they duped me into an extra year as a chief resident, so I really kind of fell into that one. Cleveland Clinic, sort of the same way. I was there for five years, and I, had, I was in charge of the fellows for four of those five years. So I really was not just a fixture in these institutions, but I was really incorporated into the, the processes of making these things happen. And, and, and I saw myself uh, continuing to participate and achieve and to push and to try to, you know, uh, have what you would expect, a, a, a successful life and a successful career. And that's, you know, where we're going. So, there's a guy, a young, aggressive cardiology fellow in the ICU at, at the, the Cleveland Clinic. And the ceiling there is filthy. No one notices the ceiling of, of these rooms, but I notice them now, and I'll tell you why at some point. But if you write your life story in advance, uh, I learned the hard way. Use a pencil. It doesn't go the way you, you expect. So I'll tell you a story. I was uh, in the early in my second year of cardiology fellowship and working very hard and learning lots and doing lots. And, and what happened was I was with some of my buddies who we were all off, you know, serendipitously one weekend. We were having a cookout and throwing the football and having a, a great time. I thought, gosh, guys, we got to get together. we we got to get ourselves a football. We found this football at the playground we were at. And uh, I said, we've got to get a football and, and get, get everybody together and play. Well, the following week, uh, we were in the ICU, and uh, I think we had just taken care of a patient who had VF'd between the helicopter and the cath lab with a right coronary infarct, and we just, you know, were sort of fighting that battle. And the, during that time, I started to notice I didn't feel exactly right, and we, we got through the things we needed to get through and got our patients straight, and we were, we were there in the ICU, and I, I mentioned to one of my buddies who's, a, who's an EP down in, in Baton Rouge now, hey, I don't, I don't feel exactly right, and I'm having this strange sensation in my neck, 
every time my heart beat. And he told me I was a wussy and uh, <laughs> that I should go back downstairs to the uh, Bella's office. But, uh, but eventually uh, we took it a little more seriously and we got an EKG and, and uh, you know, this strange vibration going up my neck on both sides, every heartbeat. It wasn't angina, it wasn't palpitations, it wasn't anything that if a patient came to me, I'd be able to figure out what in the world they were talking about. So it was a very alien type of a sensation. And uh, so we did an EKG and it was okay. And so uh, he said, come up back up to the ICU, we'll take a quick look with the echo and make sure you know, things look okay, because you're kind of a tall, um, lanky guy, and maybe you're dissecting your aorta, because that's what, you know, that's what, uh, that's pretty much the only thing that we, we considered in our differential when people would, would come to the ICU is, are they tearing their aorta? So we did a, an echo, and, and there I was in the, in the, um, one of the empty ICU beds, and my buddy's doing an echo, which is a very intimate thing. I mean, you're right next to that person. And of course, we're both looking at the screen because I thought this was sort of a big joke. Like, well, you know, we're looking for something that's not really going to be there. And um, ha have you ever noticed, like when you have a puppy and the puppy sees something that it's never seen before? What does it do? It goes like this. <laughs> And when someone's looking at your echo and they start like turning their head side to side, you start to get this queasy feeling that something is not right. And pretty soon there were four fellows looking at the echo and then two of the imaging cardiologists were there looking at the echo. And there's just a big question mark. And what they were seeing was some, some harmonic shadow of the, of the lesser curvature of the aorta and is there a, is there a, a um, dissection. So Rick Grimm came up, he's one of the imaging cardiologists, and he said, let's, let's just run you down and do a CT, make sure there's not a problem with the aorta. Because I was still having this strange sensation. I didn't have tachycardia. I just had this strange sensation of vibration in my neck. So we went and did a cardiac CT scan. And, you know, that experience is a little different than that echo, because when you get your echo, you're, you, the sonographer's standing right next to you. I mean, they are in your space. And when you get a CT scan, you're on your back in a room with your arms over your head with an IV and a power injector and a computerized voice that is almost as irritating as Siri and says, <laughs> you know, hold your breath, and then they're going to shoot you with contrast. And if you've ever had a contrast injection, you know that's a little bit of an un unsettling feeling. But by this point, all of those four fellows plus two of these imaging cardiologists were down in the CT scanner. And this was starting to get a little bit serious. And I still thought, I, you know, these guys are taking this more seriously than I would. But here we are. So we'll run through the scanner and that'll be it. So the initial thought about that scan was that there might be fluid in the transverse sinus, which is, you know, behind the pulmonary trunk above the roof of the left atrium and proximate to the, the aortic arch there in the left main coronary. But my, my sense was when I sat up after that scan and looked through the glass into the control room uh, that something was very different. And one of my buddies, Mark Eiler, who is an imaging cardiologist in, in Ohio um, now, was looking straight at me. The other guys were looking into the monitors. And you know, the pictures pop up on the screen immediately as the scanner runs. So they had clearly seen what was there, and I didn't know yet. But when Mark looked at me through, this, through that glass, and he and I looked across the, the table from each other and across the, the bedside from each other in critical situations. And I, and I knew what Mark looked like when the chips were down. And he was looking at me like that. And at that moment, I knew I was the patient. 
and, 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 and there was this, there's this barrier, you know, just like there's the glass between the control room of the scanner and the patient. And I sat on the, the gantry looking through that glass and I could see my reflection and I could see Mark through the other side. And he was looking at me different. So there was this, this issue of what, what is that in the transverse sinus and, you know, these, it was a Friday afternoon, and, and they said, well, this is, maybe this is pericarditis. Maybe this is, you know, some focal fluid collection. Why it would be there, we don't know yet, but maybe that's what's causing the symptoms. So we got an MRI. Now, the way I found out that there was any concern that this wasn't fluid was I was working on Sunday, and I looked up the CT scan in Epic, and I looked up the... And, and there's the, the bit about the fluid in the transverse sinus. And then I scrolled down, and there's the overread by Rick White, who is one of the gurus of CT. And Rick said, there's some contrast, and there may be some vascularity, and this could be a solid tumor. We should get an MRI. So Sunday morning, between, while I'm rounding, I call my cardiologist and, and Rick White, and I said, hey, Rick, uh, you know uh, Rick White overread this CT, and he thinks this could be a solid tumor. And <laughs> And Rick Grimm said, <clears throat> yeah, um, I set you up for an MRI tomorrow morning, but I didn't want to ruin your weekend, so I thought I'd talk to you about it tomorrow. Okay, you know, getting a little thicker. So we got the, the MRI the, the next morning, Monday morning, and the tech said, you know, the way we have this scheduled, we're gonna, we think this might be a tumor, but if it is, um, we're going to send you over to the PET scanner and see uh, if it's uh, metastatic or if it's, uh, you know, solitary. So this was suddenly getting way out of hand, you know. I'm still having this vibration in my neck, and we're just going down this rabbit hole of scans. And, I mean, it is like an odyssey, you know, one thing after the next. And I kind of tend to see things in epic terms anyway. So here we are. So they pull me out of the scan after about 40 minutes of listening to Frank Sinatra in this noisy torpedo tube. And I'm a little disoriented. I don't have my glasses on. I'm just like, you know, what is this? I sit up, and the tech comes in the room. Well, they're ready for you in the PET scanner, you know. So, you know, that's sort of how I found out I had a mediastinal tumor, solid tumor in the chest. And um, so I went over to the PET scan. And the PET scanner, you know, you, they run you through that <coughs> a couple of different ways, and it's just a lot of disorienting experience that's really uh, just trying. And when you know the question that the scan is going to answer, and you just have to do it and wait, uh, you get a real, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's trying. And you're by yourself. I mean, this is a very solitary thing. You go through it um, on your own. So I did that. And they said that this, this tumor looks like it's the same as the blood pool. It's not hotter than the blood pool. So it wasn't anything aggressive but didn't really tell us an answer. It wasn't anywhere else, that was good news. But I still was concerned enough that I've got a lymphoma as a 34-year-old. And so we did a heart cast. And I can show you the pictures, and I'm trying to tell you an anecdote, not show you a bunch of academic you know, pictures of this and that, but we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the picture. And there was some contrast coming um, off the left, left main. Um, and as I said, I, you know, the pictures are what they are, and I'm not going to dwell on too many pictures, but it's nice to see a picture. This is the left main coronary, and don't be jealous because this is a four French catheter, but I was pretty happy that it looked this good, at least at age 34. I bet it doesn't look this good now because it's been a few years. But the, what you can see is, and it, it doesn't come out very well, but there's a little blush of contrast right here, maybe a little up here, and there's some over here, and that should not be there. Uh, but the vessels look fine. 
So I got to do the heart cath. And you know it's funny when you you know in the board they have this magnet board at the Cleveland Clinic and you have all these uh, uh, names of all the cases and the doctors and the fellows and who's going to do the cases in each different lab. And I was the fellow who was supposed to be doing cath in in that lab with Dr. Tuzu on that particular day, and I was also the first case. <laughs> so it was like you know they never stop working yet. Uh, <laughs> So then uh, they did a pulmonary angiogram during the same procedure to make sure the pulmonary artery wasn't feeding this thing, and then a transesophageal echocardiogram. And so, you know, there's lots of things that happen and, 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 and all kinds of details. But here's one thing I learned, and that is that if you're going to gag somebody with a TEE probe, you should put the hole in their artery in the vein for the cath after you do that, not before. And so when I woke up from the TEE probe, one of my buddies was holding pressure on my leg because apparently I had broken loose and, and bled because they did the cath first and then sent over for the TE. The TE was as much to plan for the, the surgery as, as, as anything else, but they did kind of localize and identify the presence and extent of that tumor. So let me take a little break from what happened and talk a little bit about what it was, what it, what, what the impact of of it was. And, and, you know, I go back to on death and dying in um, 1969, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Roth published this uh, seminal work on um, what, what ultimately was famous for the identifying the stages of grief. And I put of the stages of grief in parentheses because, you know, I read this book in medical school, but to me, I see the same sort of paradigm for adapting and dealing with any kind of uh, bad news or unexpected news in the same way. And you all know these, and I'm not going to tell you anything today that you don't already know, but we can at least talk a little bit about the, the very first thing that happens is you start to deny what, what you've learned or what you've been, what's been demonstrated and say, well, gosh, it, it, it just can't be right. It's got to be a mistake. And my defense was, this isn't even, I, I mean, these people are taking this more seriously than I am, and I don't see how this could be anything more than just like a virus or something. I don't know. But uh, as I went along and, you know, a week into this, and I'm still having the same sensation with every heartbeat, it's starting to become a little bit more real. And then all these scans start to pile up evidence that there's something there that shouldn't be there. And the next stage is anger, and it's really a questioning, and it's a, it's a struggle against um, changing your life story and your outlook of what your life was going to be, uh, because something is changing the course of that dramatically, and you're veering into the unknown that you had never contemplated or never expected, and there's a lot of resistance to that. And so after you're done denying that it's happening, you start getting angry that it's happening. And then there's this uh, negotiation or, or bargaining concept where people begin to recognize, yeah, I'm not going to be able to change this by denying it or getting angry about it, but maybe if I can just, if I can, if, if, you know, and I write if only because it's this constant um, banter about, gosh, if only I can get past this, then I'm going to do this, and I'm going to change the way I, I live, and, and, and it really is a, a very nuanced sort of an, an evolving process. And, I, and depression comes next, and I, I think this left upon me very quickly, and, and in part because I had seen and had some insight into all the things that were possible for what was, what was happening, and the things that could that could be the outcomes. Uh, and, and all of those things were going to change uh, my view of my future in a profound way. And finally, acceptance. And for me, uh, acceptance came, you know, later. Um, but there isn't, you know, once you know what you have to do or what has to be done, your, your decision making gets very simple and straightforward. You just you just put one foot in front of the other and, and go forward. And and that there's a little bit of ease to that.
It doesn't mean it's not terrifying. So amazingly, this book was published. There was immediate resistance to these ideas, and the first, you know, shot across the bow was this uh, geriatrician who who uh, edited one of the journals about um, aging and advanced age and, and the, the process of grieving and dying. And he said there's no empirical evidence for the existence of stages of grief, like there had to be a randomized trial for that instead of an observation. And that there's no evidence that people progress through these stages. And I would say if you think about it, you're going to recognize that um, that's, that's gibberish. I mean, it really, denial. we yeah, he's denying it. I think you're right. I don't know why anyone would be that aggressive about this when if you just think about your life, you, you I mean, and, we, and, and I don't mean to put what happened to me above what happened to anyone in this room because we all have life stories and, you know, things happen. But I just thought I'd take this opportunity to share that. So game day was October 19th of 2004. I can't believe it's been 13 years. But I, I awakened, and of course my immediate thing was they're going to go after this tumor. And they think that it's going to be a hemangioma, and they think that it's going to be discrete. But these things can infiltrate the myocardial wall, and you know they're extremely rare. Nobody knows exactly what to do with them. And amazingly, uh, there are people who've had tumors like this partially resected, and they do pretty well. Um, so the idea was, look, if we can't get the tumor out, we're taking the heart out, and we're going to dissect the tumor off, and then we're going to auto transplant the heart. And I had a great transplant surgeon who was a great friend and colleague, and that's what they were going to do. But I was worried about the sternal wound infection that I was going to get, and I was worried about, I just, you know, to get, to get out of the house and go to the hospital the morning of surgery, I almost had to be sedated because I just was so anxious about what I knew was coming. And that wasn't the half of it. So I took some Ativan. My cardiologist gave me a, some Toprol for the vibration, whatever that was, and some Ativan the week before. And I went to the pre-op unit at 7 in the morning, and they did the IV and all this stuff. And then towards the OR, somewhere in between, I said goodbye to my family. And someone had to put a central line in my neck. And I didn't have anesthesia yet. And so when you know how to do that, and you know someone's doing a good job or a bad job very easily with a cook needle. Uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what, what you go through when you, when you know these things. It's hard enough not to know. But I went to the OR around 8. You know how it is. There's lots of prep and whatnot. So my wife gave me a kiss, and off I went. I was 34. This is a self-portrait. This is me, and this is my surgeon. This is Nick Madera. This is me. <laughs> and this is the tumor uh, coming off the left main. There's two clips that are still in there. I accuse Dr. Madera of littering. And here's the, here's the tumor. It came out in one piece. They didn't, I was on the bypass machine like 25 minutes. They didn't have to do too much because it shelled out just in one piece, but it was connected right here, and they had to transect that. And Dr. Griffin, Brian Griffin, said it was like it was like a plum. You know, it was like a little four centimeters by three, and it came out in one piece, and it was a hemangioma, mixed capillary cavernous hemangioma. The incidence of that is... Maybe one in one, one in best case series is one in 1.7 million. Now that's an autopsy series, <laughs> right? So, so little. It was not very reassuring to me that the only people that have been identified to have this, the only successful procedure that they had was an autopsy. So I wasn't that happy, but that's what that's what it turned out to be, and. Um, there it was. So they extubated me in the operating room around noon. And I had this amazing experience of a voice in my ear. 
after the, the kind of getting the tube out, I was resting, and this voice in my ear said, it was benign. And after that, I was completely comfortable because I knew I had lived and I knew I was not going to have a battle with cancer after this because I, I thought it was going to be a lymphoma. So I relaxed. And I slept through the afternoon, and people were back and forth, lots of the other fellows, and my family were there. And there was a single chest tube, and it was draining clear, sort of serous fluid. And I thought, OK, I'm through this. You know, I just, all I got to do is, is bounce back, and everything's back on track. Right? And that's, you know, those are the waking observations um, the day of surgery. Uh, still in the ICU, back to feeling, OK. It's going to be okay. But by 8 o'clock, things didn't look as good. And I was getting lots of fluids, and I was on compressors. I didn't know that at the time, but I did not feel good. And I was back and forth in and out of consciousness and sleeping a lot. And I'd wake up, and I'd look up, and my uh, there'd be a 120, and there'd be a 70. And I kind of looked at them a little bit, and then I did a double take, and I said, what are you going to do? Looks like the pressure is 70 and the heart rate is 120. <laughs> and I asked the nurse, and the, the anesthesia intern that was there was, uh, you know, he was pretty new. He was he was he was an intern. He started in July, but I don't think he had done a lot of cardiac anesthesia. And so he was, you know, standing at the bedside watching all of this going on. And he told me that I, he thought that I was having an anaphylactic reaction to the bypass machine. And I said, how often does that happen? And he said he thought it was about 1 in 10,000 people. Now, I had just beaten my 1 in 1.7 million odds. So I thought, you know, common things being common um, and having worked in that ICU enough to know that something else might be going on. But now he was convinced that that's what it was because they just had this inflammatory looking fluid coming out of the chest tube. And then it got dark. And by midnight, I was in big trouble. I was on three pressers. They were pouring in fluid. My cardiologist and program director all had been at a recruiting dinner trying to recruit a new imaging cardiologist to the section. They left the recruiting dinner, and they came to the ICU. The surgeon was there. The chief surgical fellow, Eric Roselli, was there. And my dad, my father-in-law, both physicians, um, my wife, some of the fellows back who were on call overnight were working. One of my buddies, Car Carlos Hubbard, was on call the night before, he'd already been there for 35 hours and had left and gone home. He got home, told his wife that I looked like I was going to die that night. So he came back. So all these people were in the room. When you ask yourself, what is the outcome of having six doctors and four nurses and anesthesia and cardiac surgical? Uh, staff in one room in the ICU all at the same time at midnight. You know, something bad is going to happen. <coughs> and that's, you know, I had this peanut gallery of all these people flooding into that room. I was profoundly fatigued. My limbs were on fire. And I thought, you know, these pressors are just contracting everything down. I can't. I just, it's just intensely painful, but I'm so fatigued I can't move, and I can't breathe. So my buddy Matt Chaco, who was a year ahead of me, stepped into the room around midnight, took one look at the situation, and immediately turned around and went back, got an echo machine, came back. By this point, the room's full of people. And he asked me, he was trying to get good windows, couldn't get good windows, so he asked me to turn, hey, turn on your right side a little bit and let's see if we can get a picture of the RV. Well, I did that and his scans showed the RV is beating empty. I mean, it's just empty. And at that moment, uh, that chest tube, that single chest tube started to drain. 
and it was draining real blood this time, and it wasn't stopping. And there was quiet, and there was an audible gasp. I mean, people saw that blood just at the same time I saw it. And that tube did not stop draining, and the pleurovac just started to fill up. And you know how the, those things do. It's just one column after the next, and it wasn't stopping. And we were all looking at it. And suddenly, there was a flurry of activity. There was oxygen and a defibrillator. Get, you know, things ready to go back to the OR. And the surgeon was standing right there, both surgeons. Both my father and my father-in-law. I mean, everybody saw this at the same time. And when I saw it, I knew, I, I mean, it just looked like I couldn't, you know, you can't beat that. So they got everything ready to roll to the OR. And I, I looked at it, and I, it just kept happening. I said, I'm, I'm, I, gotta, I can't beat this. So I turned to the nurse. He was, um, I said, I think the only thing left to do here is pray. And she was a, um, she was a Filipino. She was a member of a sect of, a Catholic sect of nurses in the Philippines. And she was ready right there. She had an icon. You know, she was, she had some oil, she anointed me. You know, amazing experience. And, you know, I'm, I'm an Episcopalian, so I wasn't, familiar, you know, it's kind of like Jay-Z Catholic. So I wasn't really <laughs> familiar with what she was doing, but I was, you know, I'll, I'll take it. Sounds good. So we rolled back to the OR very quickly. They're transfusing, I mean, people squeezing in blood, it was terrible. And I just was like, you know, I don't know what to do. And you don't know what to do, you go back to your training, right? And I was in Episcopal school for so many years, I knew the 23rd Psalm back and forth. But I was breathing about 40 times per minute, and I could not spit the words out. So I started, the Lord is my shepherd. And I, but I could get only one or two words out between breaths. And I continued to try to get to do that, um, and I, I told, later I told a priest, I said, you know, I kind of, I was, uh, I couldn't breathe and I couldn't speak. And so I kind of skipped the part about anointing the head with oil and preparing the day. You know, I just had to skip to the end. And he was like, it's okay, you were right to do that. <laughs> we got into the operating room, and I had been in that operating room, I don't know how many times, doing TEE. But there I was on the table looking up at the ceiling. And here's these two faces over my face, and they're wearing brightly colored hats, and they got their masks. And they're the nurse anesthetists who were on call. And one of them says, and I'll never forget, what's he saying? And the other one said, I think he's praying. And the first one said, well, let him finish. And I got through it to the end, and they put the mask on me. And I said, yeah, it was a black mask, it was a black white mask, but I still remember that mask. And I had absolutely no thought that I was going to survive this. But I was sad, but I was at peace. I'm surprised that this is how it's going to end. But that was going to be it. So they took the mask. And I don't know what happened after that. Years later, I would find, I would meet a patient. I met a patient in Charlottesville, an Episcopal priest. He said to me, halfway through our conversation, you know, I prayed for you the night of your surgery. I said, really? He said, yeah, I got a call, and I came down to my study, and I got on my knees, and I prayed for you. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from different people that I didn't know how they knew about this even. Well, that was Donald Moore. That was Joe Ellen's father. So he heard, you know, straight from her. But I was amazed because you, you have this sense that you're going through this experience on your own. But what you learn is as people pray for you that you're never alone. And that was a real solace for me as I recovered.
I regained consciousness before I regained anything else. And it was just blackness. And I couldn't figure out, I mean, I felt like, well, I have being, but I can't feel my body. I don't know if I'm alive or if I'm dead. I don't know what this is. It's completely black. I can't feel anything. And from that point forward, things started coming back, pain, and I could, you know, sense that, you know, there was a tube and I could breathe. And I wasn't laboring to breathe. And I, but I still couldn't see anything. And I, I thought, well, maybe I'm alive. Maybe I survived this. And when I, when it occurred to me, maybe they still have my eyes taped shut, you know, from the <coughs> OR. As soon as I had that thought, I thought about that thought, and I was like, only an alive person would think of that. <laughs> I must be alive. <laughs> and they didn't have, my, my, you know, things came back. I could start to hear. I was in the ICU. I was still on the bed, but I was, I was, I was alive. And so as I began to recover consciousness, you know, and they eventually they took the tube out, and I started to become more aware of going on in the ICU, I, I came back to sort of more what, what we all can identify as what goes on in the ICU, which is noise and hustle and bustle and activity. There's tubes and there's drains and there's art lines and there's all kinds of things that are uncomfortable and you just deal with them. They extubated me and then I was in the room by myself. I mean, I was just suddenly on my own. And so very slowly, I reached over and got the phone, and I called my house. <laughs> and there was no answer. They had sedated my wife. I think she was unconscious until about 1 in the afternoon. <laughs> so I left a voicemail. <laughs> and we, we kept that voicemail on our phone until we moved away from Cleveland. We would just save it every time it would come up on this little machine that I had lived. I, I had no idea that I was going to survive that. But there's all kinds of emotions that come with that. And, you know, we each have experiences in our lives where we understand these things. And there's all different manner of reinterpreting the things that happen. And they, all of these things I learn, you know, trying to move, trying to stand up, trying to cough, that yellow, that red pillow that they give you. I'll just tell you, whoever invented that did not have open heart surgery. Because that, red, that pillow is not uh, supportive enough to support your sternum when you cough. It's the one thing that moves is your sternum into that pillow. And it hurts. And when you sneeze, you'll remember that sneeze for the rest of your life. So I found out all these things the hard way. And but, you know, recovery is what we do. We, we, we get better, we get over, and we move on. And I had that experience, and I, won't, I don't, you know, we don't need to pass through all of it. And it's been 13 years. But, it, you know, what I would say is that this is what all of our patients go through. This is what we go through when it's our turn. And I just learned it at a very young age in a very unexpected way. And it changes your outlook and your feelings about what happened evolve. You know, you go from gratitude that you're still alive to, gosh, they, what, what were they thinking? I came out with four chest tubes, you know, you know, the second time. And so they weren't going to miss any bleeding. But four chest tubes, I mean, you feel that three days later when they pull them, you're going to remember that day, you know. It's amazing the things that our, our bodies can provide and how resilient we are. And yet, it's also amazing how fragile we are. And so I went very quickly from being this person who was like, bring the helicopter. You know, I'll take whoever you've got. It's a dissecting aorta, the VSD, the, the you know, uh, wide open mitral valve. We'll get them stable. We'll get them what they need. And we're going to get them out of this hospital alive. And I, I went from that to having a clear understanding of the incredible suffering 
and anxiety and frustration and pain that people go through just to just to do well, much less when they have complications and problems. So the aftermath is everything that happens after that. And the the scars that you get, you know, fade, but those memories are vivid and the scars are a real reminder. And I just look back, I think back to that moment in the CT scanner of seeing my own reflection in that window and seeing the people inside and seeing the difference between being on that gantry and being on the other side. And I was on the other side so much before that. And I have been since then. But crossing over, you know, sitting next to the person instead of sitting across from them and saying, hey, we'll fight this battle together, is the real difference between sympathy, which is, I feel sorry for you, and empathy, which is, I could be you. And so I'll be here without that distance between us. So I don't know what else to say. I mean, it could get preachy. I just try to do my best for each person and hope I get the chance to try again tomorrow. And I just recognize that every person's life story is the case report. And they all have anecdotes that are instructive and we can all learn from each other. And I think sharing those things in our lives and the things that we learn from our patients, one of the greatest things that we have to give one another. And, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share this little anecdote with you all and to get to know each of you. And I really couldn't be happier to be here. So thank you very much. I got my football. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And, uh, and I'll be happy to answer questions if there are or getting close to time. Thank you so much for oh, sharing. Thank you. That was pretty good for an electrophysiologist <laughs> <laughs> at this hour of the morning. So I have to ask you a scientific question. What was the cause of your symptoms? That's a great question. Um, it, it appeared that the tumor, when they sectioned it, had hemorrhage. And so there was this sudden enlargement. And in that location where the tumor was proximate to the aorta, there was the thought that, hey, if it got suddenly bigger, you know, it may have been there for forever, slowly growing, but if it got suddenly larger, that it's pressing on the aorta and you're feeling a sense of vibration transmitted through this valid tumor. Um, yes, why did it hemorrhage? Um, it may be because we were playing football the, the weekend before, which I never did, and it may also be because I had been I had been in an aspirin study that was looking at platelet function, and I took two weeks of aspirin and then I drew some blood. And, and I, I hesitate to bring that up because one of my buddies is running that little aspirin study, and I don't want him to ever feel like that was the, the cause. But but it, 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 it's unclear. I mean, it was just it was a it was a vascular tumor in it, in its way. Thanks for sharing that, Sean. Um, I was struck particularly by the intern who misdiagnosed what was going on that evening. And I was getting physically angry at that intern. But you kind of seem to move past that relatively quickly. So I'm just curious about what that plays in kind of your recovery about that and that component of it, because there was clearly a, a missed opportunity. So I will tell you that that is one of those things that I felt like um, goes back to physical diagnosis and asking questions when things don't fit together. And it's sort of one of those uh, 
moment where I hope that the good judgment comes from the experience, which came from not re-examining the patient and figuring out that there was a three-liter hemothorax uh, all afternoon. And, um, you know, I think that that maybe provided a learning opportunity for that individual that hopefully they won't forget. I won't forget it. And, and it's also one of those episodes where you say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm thankful for what I got, and I'll, I'm, 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 I appreciate that everybody was doing their best. But the, the fact that this was identified late, you know, is just part of the tapestry. And you go back and look at the different little pieces periodically, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy thing. But, it, you know, it's always easy to, to second guess. But it did seem like you could find a dull lung field if you listen. Thank you again, Dr. Cape. Please, um, please stop by and thank our sponsors for this week, uh, both Jansen and Novartis. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Now I guess we've got to go look and see what. Yeah, we got to get the work of the day done. We'll do. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So much. Sure. Good. Can I take your. Oh, yeah. um,